Okay, gas logs. Here we go. Hopefully you've got a nice visual aid in doing the simulation. At any time, you can always go to the FET simulation to help you with um, yeah, the visual aid of seeing the gas particles, how they move, how they behave. We're going to go over the basic characteristics here first and discuss uh, the kinetic molecular theory. But in general, we know gases expand and compress to fill any container. All right, they are in that phase of matter, gone from solid to liquid to gas now, where they're in constant random motion. We assume that they have no attractive or repulsive forces. And individually, the gas particles themselves have very negligible volume because they're so small with regards to the space in the container. When we're talking about the volume, we're usually actually measuring the volume of the container of which the gas is in. All gases exert pressure, and hopefully you got that from the FET simulation, where you were able to see that as they hit the walls of the container, that's what's exerting the pressure. Pressure of the gas is caused by the collision with the walls and each other. And you adjusted lots of different of the parameters on there to see what would increase the pressure and so forth of the gas. As you can see, this one right here has a much larger volume than this space right here where the gas has been compressed. And we know that the, with the less space, the particles will hit the walls of the container more in this particular diagram. And this just shows you again, this is the solid held together with uh, lots of intermolecular forces in place where they can only vibrate, have very little kinetic energy, but they vibrate. The liquid phase where they have broken free a little bit, have rotational flowing movement, but are still pretty close together. And then over here are the gas where they're really spaces, spaced out in constant random motion, they fill their container completely. Whereas, like, remember we say that the liquid takes the shape of the container. But the gas actually completely fills the container. The magnitude of the pressure is related how often and how hard the molecules strike the wall of the container. And that has a lot to do with how fast they're going. And we are, will look at how to increase the pressure by making them move faster. So basic characteristics of just regular stuff about the phase of gases. Now the kinetic molecular theory. These are the postulates and assumptions they make about gases, describing their behavior. Of course, we said are composed of molecules whose size is negligible or so small compared to the average distance between them. So we really say that they are so small that they individually in and of themselves don't take up volume, have no volume. And that assumption sometimes gets deviated in different conditions, but under ideal conditions, we assume gases, individual, individual particles have no volume. They move in random straight lines and bounce off each other, bounce off the the walls of the container, but they do move, move in straight lines in those patterns, okay, randomly. I'm sure you, you'll recall from the simulation, like here in the next slide, forces of attraction between and repulsive forces are very weak. They just random movement, bouncing off. And they're far apart, except when they collide, and they just bounce off, go the other direction. If they had attractive forces, they would kind of get closer to each other, like the particles in a liquid. If they had repulsive forces, of course, they'd be repelling each other in the other direction. But here, they just randomly move and bounce off the walls in those straight lines, so forth, as you see in this lovely gift here. When they collide with one another, the collisions are elastic. No energy is lost. They just bounce 
off and go in the other direction. So we say they're perfectly elastic collisions. Another one here showing them bouncing, going in different directions, hitting each other, hitting the walls of the container. But no kinetic energy is lost, it just transfers. Bump in, goes the other direction, and so forth. Now, as you can see here, temperature affects the average kinetic energy of the particles. Higher temperature means they're moving faster. They have more on average in terms of their kinetic energy. Now, we say average kinetic energy because if you're looking at either of the diagrams, they're not all moving at exactly the same speed. So the kinetic energy is going to vary from particle to particle, but the average kinetic energy of the system is proportional to the temperature. So as the temperature increases, that kinetic energy increases. So the total energy will, so you can see in this one, the low temperature moving very slowly, which we also know equates to lower pressure because they're not hitting the walls of the container as fast or as often. Higher temperature, higher pressure, definitely having more collisions, faster collisions with the walls of the container. Units, definitely have to know your units. This is probably the toughest part of the gas laws, realizing there's a bunch of different pressure units that you need to know. Standard pressure, one atmosphere, now this is the atmospheric pressure at sea level. So one atmosphere is equal to six, 760 torr or 760 millimeters of mercury. They're the same measurement. One's representing the like actual device, the millimeters of mercury. The other one's, you know, of his name. I think it's Torricelli or something. So those are both the same measurements there. The last one here is 101.3 kPa kilopascals. All of these equate to standard pressure, atmospheric pressure at sea level, and they use all different versions of them in the gas law problem. So you have to know and be able to use any of these pressure units. You can convert between them with these values too, because they're equal to one another. Volume, for the most part, you're gonna see it in milliliters or liters. And most problems, you can just leave it in milliliters there's only one particular equation where you're going to have to convert it to liters in order to use the equation. That's the ideal gas equation. But uh, the simple conversion here, definitely need to know that. It'll be important for solutions later too. For example, how would that be the 2091 milliliters equals how many liters? Very good, you divide by a thousand. Now, you know, back in the beginning of the year, I made you make, I would make you set up a T-chart and show the dimensional analysis. We're way beyond that now. All you need to do, move it over three spots, like so. Get your answer, move on. We're not going to bother that conversion should be like a quick one in your head by now. Okay, so how about this next one? What do we get? How many liters? That's very good. Yes, three decimal spaces to the left there. Move it over to get your liters. That conversion I do not expect to see in dimensional analysis. Last but not least, we need to discuss the very important factor of temperature. For, you know, standard temperature is considered zero degrees Celsius, the freezing point of water, or the normal freezing point of water. However, we happen to use the metric system of temperature, metric unit or the SI, international system. It's called Kelvin. Does anybody happen to know what is special about the Kelvin scale? Yes? Can't it never go to zero? Well, yes, we refer to that zero Kelvin as what fact? What is that called? Absolute zero. And yes, they have never really attained it in the lab. They've gotten very close. But it is where particles have absolutely no energy and completely stop moving. 
We use the Kelvin scale because the very bottom of the Kelvin scale is zero. That means you don't have any other negative numbers on that scale. And for the purposes of doing our gas law problems, if you're using like Celsius, you'll have negative temperatures. And that of course would result in negative pressures and other things and that doesn't work out. So for all of the gas law problems, temperature has to be converted to Kelvin before you plug it into the formulas. All right, and it's very simple factor. All you gotta do is add 273. As zero degrees Celsius equals 273. So here we just add 273 to our 50 and you get uh, 323K. Now wants to point out too that this does make it have three significant figures there. When you add in the Kelvin, it makes it have the three significant figures there. <laughs> For example, here, one of these negative numbers which we wouldn't want to put into one of the formulas because then that would make us have a negative pressure or a negative volume, which are just not possible. So we change it to Kelvin, and therefore we get 248K. Add the 273, change it over to Kelvin. You cannot work a gas law problem, and it will be wrong if you do not change the temperature to Kelvin. All right, starting with Boyle's Law, which you probably saw one of the ones in the vet simulation slides, where we're looking at the relationship between, um, we're looking at the relationship between pressure and volume. As you can see in our lovely diagram here, the volume is one liter, the pressure is one atmosphere here, as the volume is uh, decreased by a half. The pressure goes up by two, decreased by a fourth. The pressure goes up by, you know, by four times. This particular case, temperature is being held constant. And the pressure and the volume variables are inversely proportional to one another or indirect. See, the pressure goes up, the volume decreases. They are opposite variables. And really, even for AP, you know, yes, this is great to know this is Boyle's Law, but in AP, they don't really even care if you know who the guy is. It's, they want you to know that pressure goes up, the volume decreases of the system if the temperature is being held constant. So they want you to know the relationship between the different variables of the gases. It does have kind of a decay curve graph here, like so. And then here, as you see, like as the um, volume is decreasing, you see the pressure gauge going up right here. Definitely happening there. This is the only set that happens to be inversely proportional. All the other ones are going to be direct. So if you can remember that it's pressure volume that are inverse and just know everything else, all the other ones will follow a nice direct relationship. Now, for example, this is more of a conceptual question, although there are these and there are the math type questions. Helium filled balloon is released into the sky, assuming constant temperature. What happens to the volume of the balloon as it goes up in elevation? So as you go up in the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure gets less. So what's gonna to happen to our balloon? Yeah, the balloon is going to get bigger, the volume is going, going to expand, and it's going to increase. Now, if you get too far up, the temperature would change drastically because it would be really cold up there, too, where the air is thinning. But if we're keeping temperature constant, then the balloon is just going to expand and get bigger. All right, Charles' Law. Charles' Law happens to be the volume temperature relationship set up in the fraction format because this one happens to be direct, as I said. Pressure is held constant. The graph, of course, is a linear relationship. If you increase temperature, you increase the volume if pressure is being held constant. Now, I don't know if some of you care. You're welcome to use this, but I'm not fun of, I don't like fractions, so I don't use the formula in that format. 
I do V1 T2 equals V2 T1. And you're welcome to use that if you want to. I find the math to go faster that way. But whatever you decide, feel free to use the correct, you know, form of the equation that you like. But as you can see here, pressure remains the same. If you uh, decrease the volume, decrease the temperature and so forth. So basketball left outside, the temperature dropped from 50 to 25. What happens to the volume of the ball? I'm sure you've seen this if you have like some of those bouncy balls where they're nice and round and then you leave them outside in the cold and then they're just what? They're smaller. Yeah, it's just really a lot smaller. They've shrunk in a little bit. The size of it would decrease. I wouldn't say it like deflates because then you're like messing with the pressure there, but definitely these are more of the ones that are more adjustable volume where it definitely will shrink in a little bit. All right, the soda can crush video. Before we watch the little video though, let's take a moment to read through all of our questions. So we know what we're kind of looking for in this particular example. I know that it was briefly shown to you in the FET simulation, but as the can is heated, what happens to the air and water molecules inside the can? How about when it's placed in the cold water? What happened to the pressure when it was heated and cooled? And how does the air pressure work outside of the can? And of course, ultimately, what's going to be the relationship between pressure and temperature. So that's an easy one to do if you have aluminum cans. Definitely kind of, it is very startling weird that you just put it in the cold water and there it goes. But um, let's talk through the gases of this and the science of it. So can is heated, what happens to the air and water molecules inside the can? So let's first address what happens to the water. Pour a little bit of water in the can, start heating it, what happens to the water? It turns into a gas, yes. It vaporizes. You have some of it vaporizing. You saw some of the steam coming out of the little tiny, you know, the drink hole area. So the water starts to evaporate. So now you've got water vapor gas floating around in there. What's happening to the regular air that's already in there? Because it's already in the gaseous phase, but now we're heating it. So what happens to those particles? If we're heating them, they're going to be what? Moving faster, have more kinetic energy, yes. Increasing the pressure inside the can. Yes, some of those, some of it's coming out of steam, but like it's, there's still a good majority of gas particles in there. The water vapor and the regular air particles in there. Both, yeah, as they're being heated are going to be moving faster. Now, when it's placed in the cold water, what happens to the gas particles inside. Now I'm talking about the air and the water vapor. So they, stop, they, they definitely cool down very quickly. And what happens inside? We saw it crush in. So what happened to the pressure inside of the can? Decreases, Decreases dramatically, okay? So when you heated it, a little bit of pressure, Definitely, it was still hitting the walls of the container. Some of it was coming out of the drink hole, but you know, it kept its nice can shape. Let's put it that way when it was being heated. When you cooled it, it crushed in, so it didn't keep the shape. Now, how does the air pressure work on the outside of the can? Because yes, we know that the pressure on the inside dramatically decreased, but what else helped crush the can besides the, the pressure inside? Uh, 
talking about the atmospheric pressure, which, oh, by the way, you probably don't even realize it, but there's a ton of it on you right now as you're sitting here. But we're all accustomed to it because this is how we have always lived. But the pressure on the outside is much greater now when they put it in the cold water than on the inside. So both of those forces, the outside atmospheric pressure being much greater and the pressure inside the can dropping dramatically is what crushes it really, makes it do that quick jolt. So the relationship between pressure and temperature, pressure decreases or temperature decreases, what happens to your pressure? It also decreases. So this one's a direct as well. It's under Gay-Lussac's law. Pressure, temperature, volume is being held constant. And as you can see on the graph, it's a nice linear relationship, directly proportional. So Boyles, Charles, Gay-Lussac, as you can see, two of them are changing. One is held constant for each of those particular gas laws. Happens to the auto uh, tire pressure during the winter, assuming that there's no leaks in the car tires. What's going to happen to our air pressure? And I don't know, a lot of you are driving, so maybe you check these things now. It always happens on my car, and my car is fairly new where it has like the, the computerized sensors, so it like flashes on for me when my tire pressure goes really low. And actually didn't do it this year, but if I were to check it, there's usually about a, I'd say at least a four point swing in the PSI because it's uh, pounds per square inch is the American unit on the tires in the car, but uh, it's about a four, a numerical of four, so it goes up to like 38 down to 34. Usually see a swing in my tires if I were to check the gauge. But in the winter time, obviously they cool down. And sometimes a couple of years ago, it came on when I had to actually go over to the gas station and add some more air to my tire because it was just slightly low. And you wanna keep them within their pressure range because that maximizes your tire usage. These tires can be very expensive, just so you know. So you want to take care of them and use them properly and maintain them. So the pressure is going to decrease, of course, in the winter time. And then in the summertime, when it gets nice and warm, they're going to go back up. Like today, I bet if I checked my tire pressure today, it will be more in the 38 range. All right, the last one here, and we don't really use this one all that much in gas laws, but I figure I should just tell you about the relationship. Because most of the time, the moles, the actual number of particles in the closed container, we don't usually manipulate that. The volume and moles are directly proportional. This is Avogadro's law, provided that temperature and pressure remain constant. Like so, temperature and pressure are constant here. Equal volumes of different gases contain an equal number of particles, and those particles each count, of course. We talk about it like mole of gas. So like in each of these balloons here, if we're saying we have a mole of helium versus a mole of oxygen and a mole of nitrogen, there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles in each of these balloons. And each of those balloons have the same volume, according to Avogadro's law because they're at the same temperature, standard temperature and standard pressure. So at 1 atm, 273k. So those balloon volumes should all be the same, regardless of which gas is inside, because the number of particles is going to maintain that volume. One other thing to note about this, obviously, if you don't like the fractions, you can do the same thing we did with the other equation, and to V2 and one, and like you can do that with gay lussacs as well. Put them to the opposite sides and use them like that. They do have up here too, like helium is four grams, 
oxygen is 32 grams per mole, and then the nitrogen is like 28.02 grams per mole. So the only thing that would be different about these balloons, not the volume, not the number of particles or moles inside, the only thing that would be different is the density. And we're going to talk about density on Thursday and gas laws with density. But they're the same volume, so this factor is okay, but the masses are all different. So each one of these balloons, because it's a different gas inside, is going to have a different density. So that's kind of the only notable thing there that um, is kind of interesting about those comparisons for Avogadro's law. And that is kind of more of an AP thing that go into that, you know, heavier gases move slower, lighter gases move faster if they're at the same temperature kind of thing. But, um, and that kind of incorporates in to uh, looking at the, the, the way that they behave in their closed containers. All right, so now have like three practice problems using the different laws. The first thing I would do in setting these up, of course, read through your problem, but I like to read through and look at my variables, what I have here. The sample of helium gas in a balloon is compressed from four liters to 2.5 liters, so those are two volumes at constant temperature, so we know that temperature is constant here. The pressure of the gas in the 4 liter is 210 kPa. What is the pressure be at the other volume? So really this is a pressure volume change. And if that's the case, which of the different gas laws are we going to use here? Which one do we use here? Pressure, volume, temperature is constant. Boyle's law, okay. This is a Boyle's law problem. What I want to see in terms of work, write out the formula. Like so, that's the first thing. Have your formula, substitute in the formula. The key to this is making sure that you do the pairings correctly. Like it starts at four liters, so this is volume one. It goes to 2.5 liters, that's going to be volume two. So if the pressure at four liters, so this must be P1, and then the pressure that you're seeking is P2. That's one we're missing. You read through and identify the, the pairs correctly. You shouldn't have any trouble plugging this in and getting your answer. Now we have for volume one, pressure one, this is two to 10 kPa. And this is four liters. We're missing pressure two. So that's, I'm gonna leave in as the variable. And our um, volume two was 2.5 liters. And what you should notice here, the liters are gonna cancel. So obviously you're going to get your answer in KPA. And then look at all of your measured values for significant figures. We have two here, two here, two here. So your pre new pressure should have two significant figures in the answer. So what is P2? What do we get for P2? Yeah, so 336 would be the calculator answer. How do we make that have two significant figures? We keep the three. What do we do to the second three? Round that up to a four and then add in a filler zero. Love those filler zeros. KPA, don't forget your units. And you have your final answer. Now this is what I wanna see 
formula, plug in the numbers, then get your answer. That's all you need to do, no other steps. Just show where you're setting it up, like so. Now there's a couple more practice problems. I want you to go and try those real quick on your own. And we'll come back in a few minutes. Okay, for our practice number two here. Gas, gas sample occupies at 40 degrees, occupies a volume of 232 milliliters. If the temperature is raised to 75 degrees Celsius, what is the volume assuming the pressure remains constant? So which one are we talking about here? Which gas ball? This one's Charles, very good. So this is going to be, you're doing it this way, V1, T1, V2, T2, or V1, T2, V1. My preferred to start that way, but um, what's the only other th main thing you have to remember for this particular problem before you begin? No, the volume actually doesn't have to be in liters for this one. This one is okay to leave in milliliters. But something does need to be changed. What needs to be changed here? Temperature needs to be converted. If you don't convert it, then you're going to have issues. All right, so 273 here. We add that. And make sure that you've done that. Three forty-eight. Right. Is that right? I do that right. Three forty-eight K. Okay. Let's see. All right. Seventy-three plus two seventy-three. We get three thirteen K. So whenever you're given temperature, not in Kelvin, convert it, please. Before you begin, that goes for. Charles and Gay Lussac, because they both have temperature as being part of the, um, the variables in there. So now we can just plug in, but we have to figure out our variables. So at 40, this is going to be T1, occupies this volume, V1. Over here, this is going to be T2. So volume 2 is what we're missing, what we need to find. Now we can just plug and chug, basically, stick them in here, 232 milliliters, uh, 348K, and V2 is what we're missing, so we'll leave that one in, and then T1, 313K. You should notice that the K's cancel, and yes, you're going to get your volume in milliliters, that is something to point out, though, that the volume in milliliters is okay because these are really just like proportional type equations here. Later on, when we get to the ideal gas equation, it has to be in liters, and you'll see why. But there is one where you do have to recognize that the volume measurement must be in liters. So looking here, how many significant digits should we leave in our answer? For our second volume here. Three, and what is our pressure then with wrapping and all that? Yes, three, exactly. This is going to be 258 uh, milliliters, right? I'm going for volume this time, so let's go for milliliters. Don't forget your unit. So, and yes, that is the correct answer. All right, so looking at this one, I'm sure you can already see that volume is remaining constant. So what is the gas law to use here? Yeah, the Gay-Lussac law. And for this one, you know, it's P1 over T1 equals P2 
not an R, not something different. D2 over T2. Or you can do the P1, T2 equals P2, T1 arrangement. Either is fine. However you like to do that. But notice that we do have this sample of neon. This is going to be your T1, but we need to add 273 to that. Change it over to Kelvin. 362K. Oh, there's another glitch in here too. They're telling us that it's at standard pressure. They didn't actually give us the value of that. And the other pressure happens to be in KPA. That's going to be your second pressure. So, what is standard pressure for KPA? Yeah, so when it says standard pressure here, it's telling you that this is 101.3 kPa. You're supposed to be able to reference those standard pressures at any time. So that's going to be the first pressure, P1, it's going to be the standard pressure. Now that we have all our variables identified, we can plug them in. So we get... 101.3 kPa times the second temperature. The new temperature is going to be T2, so that's the one we're missing. P2 was 145 kPa, and the first temperature was 362K. Now, as you can see here, the kPa's will cancel and you're going to be left with the temperature in Kelvin. But something else I want to point out to you about number sense, if you know the relationship between the pressure and the temperature, you can see here the pressure goes from standard pressure at 101.3 to 145. Pressure goes up. What does that mean that your numerical value of your temperature should do? It should also go up. So, you can kind of check your numbers and calculations if you're getting a number that's lower than 362K, you know you did something wrong. So pay attention to the relationship and you can get some number sense and, and verify your numbers that way. Now we go ahead and calculate, cancel down to T2. So what do we get for our T2 here? Multiply and divide 145 times the 362 divided by the 101.3. So I'm getting 518K. Now, another little thing about this one, added a little nuance. They gave us the original temperature in Celsius. So at this point, when they're asking for the new temperature, they want you to uh, convert it back to Celsius. So how do we convert it back from Kelvin to Celsius? All you need to do is subtract the 273. You go ahead and do that. You get 245 degrees Celsius. Can check ourselves because yes, the original temperature has gone up. Both the pressure increase, so the temperature should increase following the direct relationship between pressure and temperature here. So there we go. That's what we should do for this fun problem. All right, so these three are the basics. Very, very basic bottom level gas law type deal. Now we're going to get into some other ones that combine a few little other things. The combined is just that we're going to combine all of them together. Dalton's law, partial pressure. Now that's uh, talking about pressures of the gas mixture. And then I'm not sure if we'll get there, but we'll address the ideal gas equation if we have time today. But the combined is a very helpful one to have. Even if you don't want to memorize the other three, like specifically, the combined is a good way of getting all of the variables together. So 
most of the time, too, the gases aren't only going to be subject to two variables. They're going to be subject to all of the different ones, the pressure, the temperature, and the volume at any time. And even sometimes the moles. You, they could throw in Avogadro's in there. They do in AP, not necessarily so much here for honors, but there's two variations you can use. You can use the combine like this, where it's just P, P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. You're also welcome to write it like this. My preferred cross up the T's, get them out of the way, out of the fraction. That's one variation. Now later on, like I said, very rarely do they ever adjust the moles because literally they would have to take out some of the particles or add more particles in to adjust the, the moles inside the closed container. But you could set it all for all of these variables because if you really think about it, you have all four of the laws rolled into this combined because if you have the pressure volume relationship, that one's going to be boils. If these are constant, you just cross them out and you don't need them. So basically you can just memorize this one formula and then cross out what's constant and then you have everything ready to go and you don't have to memorize individual formulas. So the top here, P1, V1 equals P2, V2, that's boils. Now we're looking here at the V1, T1, V2, T2, if pressure and moles stay constant, that's going to be Charles, right? So you could just do that. You could use those two variables, cross off the constant ones. So that's Charles' law. If you're using the pressure temperatures and getting rid of the volume and the moles because they're constant, that's Gay-Lussac's law right there. And then, last but not least, if the pressure and temperature were constant, like so, this one, the volume moles, that would be Avogadro's law. So if you memorize the combined, you really have all four of them together, or that specific one of the combined. Although this one, like I said, the moles are not changing usually, so this one's okay to have at, in, you know, as a tool. But if you know, you can always cross off the ones that are constant, and then you have the formula to use to do the calculation. And like I said, I'm not so much into caring whether you know this one is Charles, but I want you to know that volume and temperature are directly proportional. So if one increases, the other increases. Same thing with boils. Like you don't necessarily know, need to know the name, but pressure volume, that's inversely proportional. Okay, those are the important things. Knowing the relationship between the different variables. All right, so practicing some of the combined here. Luckily, they're kind to us in this problem because they gave it to us in Kelvin. But go ahead, I think there's like three problems. Give you some time to work on them. Utilizing the combined to your advantage. All right, break over, here we go. Ready to go over stuff. Okay, so here for the combine, we have V1, V1, V1. What will be the volume? So now it looks like we're missing V2. Pressure is raised to 10, so this is P2 and then temperature. T2, temperature's already in Kelvin, so this is nice, just plug and chug. P1, V1, T2, T2, V2, T1. And all you have to do is, you know, insert your numbers here. So we have five ATM times 20 liters. T2 is the 250K. P2, 10 ATM, V2 is what's missing, 
and our T1 was 500. So let's see how this works out. We see that the pressure increases, but the temperature decreases. So we have kind of opposing factors going on here as to see what happens to our volume. So the volume decreased overall. V2 here, now how many significant figures based off of the measured values in the problem? Should we have for our second volume? Anyone? Significant figures? Is anybody still there at home? I got one chat message today so far. Five, yes, we would want one significant figure here. Five liters, a predictor unit. This one only has one, that one only has one. So does this one, so does this one. There's a ton of ones that only have one up there. So you would only include the one significant figure in your answer. And hey, we're correct, there we go. Oops. All right, for this one, adds on the added, added extra step. It's basically the same setup here. The only thing extra though is you have to change your Celsius to Kelvin. So you would add in your 273, add in your 273. This is what, 283K. And then this is 294K, I think. And once again, it just becomes very systematic. You use your formula. And as you notice, probably in these formulas and these problems up here, they don't really address the moles changing at all, so you don't need to use that version. Like so, you go ahead and stick that in there. So volume one, pressure one, this is temperature one, volume two, temperature two, so that looks like we're finding pressure two. That's what's missing. So I just kind of systematically go through and start labeling things. So I'm putting them in the correct spots in the equation. 500 milliliters, T2, 294, K. Pressure two, that's what we're missing. Second volume, 750 milliliters. And the temperature one was 283K. So the volume goes up, the temperature goes up. So I'm going to think that the pressure is also going to go up then because we don't have anything opposing here. So 108 times 500 times 940. Well, maybe not. Pressure and volume are indirect. That's right. Never mind. Maybe the pressure goes, no, yeah, maybe it goes down, I don't know. Yeah, it goes down, huh? It did go down. Indirect pressure here. All right, so I'm getting 74.8 kPa. Three significant figures based off of what we have up here. And with the idea that this is becoming very repetitive, did this problem. And as you notice up here in all of our numbers, that's one significant figure, one significant figure, and so forth. So when you calculate, get your answer. Hopefully this is what you got. But you needed to change it over to 100 liters, where the two zeros are filler zeros because only one significant figure. Good so far? All right. Now we're going to talk Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. This is totally different than what we've been doing because now we're looking at combining gases and making a gas mixture. Now the gas mixture is that the gases aren't reacting or anything, they're just floating around together in the same container, basically is what's going on. So here we have our, our green gas, couple dots in there, that's at 200 kPa. And we have our red gas, whatever gas this is, and these ones are individual gases, so 
you know, you could say that that one's like helium in there because it's a monatomic gas. This one right here, though, as you can see, there's two circles together. So that one's going to be one of your diatomic ones like hydrogen, oxygen, or something. It's at 400 kPa. Now, if you were to take all of these and add them together, take those gases and shove them in the same container, what you should notice here is that their pressures, their, each individual pressure of the gas is additive and it creates the total pressure. So each gas exerts a certain amount and you should have also noticed this in your PET simulation when you put the heavy particles and the light particles in there that those gases, if you let it stabilize, and then you looked at the total, you looked at them individually and you looked at the total, they were additive. So they would have added to equal the entire total here. So this is the generalized equation. The total of the gas mixture is going to be the addition of each partial pressure. Now in this particular example, there are three gases in the gas mixture, so you would only go to P3 here. You would only go to that one and stop. If there were four gases, then you would add in a P4, five gases, and so forth depending on how large the gas mixture is. But that's a generalized equation for Dalton's law of partial pressure. Now, using regular notation and everything, we're doing a simple problem here where there's only two gases in the gas mixture, but this is how you would write it. What is the partial pressure of hydrogen gas in a gas mixture of hydrogen helium? The total pressure is 600. Partial pressure of the helium is 439. So, the basic equation here, the total pressure, we only have the two gases in the mixture. We have hydrogen and helium. This is how you write partial pressure notation. So, the partial pressure of the hydrogen, P for the partial pressure, and then the little subscript H2 representing hydrogen here, and the partial pressure of the helium, like so. Now, we know the value here. This is 600 millimeters of mercury. We do not know the partial pressure of the hydrogen, but we do know the partial pressure of the helium is 439 millimeters of mercury. Then this becomes a very simple subtraction. And significant digit-wise, remember, this is, at, this is going to be subtracting. So you need to go to place value. This one goes to the ones this one goes to the one, so when you subtract it, it should go to the ones. So our partial pressure of our hydrogen then is going to end up being 161 millimeters of mercury, like so. So that's very simple. We will talk about another version or different ways of manipulating uh, Dalton's law of partial pressure with mole fractions in, on Thursday. We will address that next class. Now this is one version where you just have like a gas mixture and you're adding gases together. That, that's pretty simple. There's another type of looking at um, Dalton's law of partial pressure and that's with percentages. Another simple one with percentages. We'll do the mole fraction stuff later, but most, most students, you know, get the concept immediately of how to figure this out. But I'm going to address maybe some of the math basics that some people forget over time. Because in general, we do a lot of percent calculations in chem. So in general, percent calculations are the part over the whole times 100 give you the percent. That's the generalized math equation here. And let's think about which one is the part and which one is the whole here in terms of our problem. We have if air, if the air from a blast furnace contains a total pressure of 3.7 atm, then 85% of the air is oxygen, okay? What is the partial pressure of the oxygen here? So we have our entire gas mixture, which would be our whole, and this happens to be the air, right? And our part of our gas mixture that we're looking at is the partial pressure of the oxygen. So if you think about it, the partial pressure of the oxygen 
divided by the um, total for the air here, right? Because oxygen's uh, only a portion of air times 100. That's going to give you that percent of the O2 that you saw up here in the problem. So this is the basic construct of where that percentage is going to come from. So here we would put PO2, that's what we're missing, over, I'll put the times 100 over here, over our 3.7 ATM, and that's going to get you 85%. Now, most of you can skip this part, skip this part, because you can go straight to this idea of 0 0.85 times 3.7. That's going to give you your partial pressure of your oxygen. For those of you that don't mentally see this, but really you're just taking the percent of the total here, 0 0.85 of 3.7. But how am I manipulating the percent equation to do that? this is how it actually, or where it comes from. And I think so much of us, we forget where we're coming from here and we go straight. And then sometimes we don't do this step correctly. But 0.85 of 3.7, what is our partial pressure of our O2 then? 3.7 times 3.1, right? 3.1 and this is uh, ATM. Don't forget your unit. 3.1. The last simple ones for Dalton's Law of Partial Pressure has to do with a lab technique because in the lab it's very difficult to measure gases because obviously it's hard to track them. But what we'll do is we use a method where we collect the gas over water and basically fill some kind of measuring device like a graduated cylinder with water and you flip it over, you stick the tube in there and then the gas can collect in there and it pushes the water down. Water, it displaces the water basically. But the problem is when you're collecting gas over water, we all know that liquids have a little bit of vapor pressure from the liquid in there. So it becomes a gas mixture actually inside the measuring container where you're collecting the gas because we have this little vapor pressure sitting on top of the water here that will be mixed in with the gas that you're collecting. So remember that dynamic equilibrium is occurring, creating that vapor pressure. Some of it's evaporating, some of it's condensing, but they're doing that at equal rates. And it creates that vapor above the water line. And that's also where we get our vapor pressure curve idea. Okay. So here showing you how this kind of experiment would be set up where you have the reaction over here in a test tube with a stopper with a hole and then the tubing comes in to deliver the gas to your collecting device. Like I said, what we usually collect them in is we just flip over the graduated cylinders and then fill them with water before we flip them over. And then the, the, as the gas collects, the water pushes downward and it goes in here. Now, as you can see, this is zinc plus hydrochloric acid. So as one of the products of that, you're gonna get hydrogen gas. So in this particular experiment, they're collecting hydrogen gas inside. So mostly hydrogen gas in here, but then a few water due to the water vapor from the vapor pressure of the liquid in there. So in order to do this technique and figure out what is the pressure of just the hydrogen or just the individual gas, we have to look up on a chart the vapor pressures of water at different temperatures. Now, if we're doing the lab in here, we would look at our, um, you know, our phones to let us know what the temperature is. Then we go look on the table and we would figure out what the vapor pressure of water is at that particular temperature and use it in our calculations. But here, as you can see, we have our total going to equal the gas in, in the previous example that would have been hydrogen and then plus the partial pressure of the water vapor. And all you have to do is like refer to the table to figure out because they measured all of the different vapor pressures at different temperatures. So we can easily figure out what the uh, pressure of the gas is that's being collected. So here for an example, 
gas is collected by water displacement at 40 degrees. The total pressure was 110 kPa. And use the table to determine the partial pressure exerted by the gas. So, you know, PT equals the P gas plus the partial pressure of the water vapor. And we would get our 110 kPa here. Partial pressure of our gas, which you don't know. But all we have to do is look here at 40 degrees and figure out the partial pressure of the water vapor. And it happens to be 7.38. And then now it's just a simple subtraction. Once again, going with the idea of place values, this goes out to the tenth, uh, the hundredths. So does this one. So when you do the subtraction here, your answer should also come out to the hundredths, like so. If we were able to do lab, you know, we would do one like this for this particular unit, and you would collect the gas over the water and so forth, and then be able to calculate eventually the moles of the gas in there from a bunch of different things that would have been fun and cool. All right, looks like we do have some time. We'll, we'll talk about ideal gas law real quick. Ideal gas law describes the physical behavior of an ideal gas in terms of pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles, uh, moles of gas present. Number of moles is the fourth variable that is added to describe the gas sample. Ideal gas works best when applied to problems involving gases containing, contained under certain conditions. So, like I said, by collecting the gas over water, you can figure out the pressure of the gas, you can figure out the volume of the gas because you measure it from the graduated cylinder, you can figure out the temperature in the room. That would allow you to figure out the moles and you could calculate the grams from there, and you could do the stoichiometry with it and a bunch of different things. So it's a very helpful, useful equation. Most people call it PIVNERT, PV equals NRT. Now, this one also involves a gas constant. The universal gas constant is R. And they never ever really expect you to memorize the R, even in AP, because they're found here on the formula sheet. But you have to be able to know when to use the certain gas constants appropriately. And the gas constants, really, the only thing that makes them different, if you look at their different units in here, they all have liters, they all have moles, and they all have Kelvin. The only thing that's different is the pressure variable. The 0 0.0821 is in ATMs. The 8.314, that one's in KPA. And the 62.4 is the one that's in TOR, which is also millimeters of mercury. So depending on which pressure they give you, you have to know which gas constant value to plug into the equation. So really just identify which pressure measurement they're going for, or which one is actually in the problem, then select the correct R value to use in there. This one real quick this one's easy all right so determine the temperature in k if 2.49 moles of a gas contained in a one liter vessel at a pressure of 143 kpa so this one's a plug and chug there isn't anything to convert as pv equals an rt we have we're looking for the temperature so for pressure this is 143 kPa. The volume was already in liters for us. Now, if this one had been in milliliters, we would have had to convert it. This is the one where you have to have it in liters. The moles, 2.49 moles. Now, the ideal gas constant here, they gave it to you in the problem. Because this is in kPa, we're going to use the 8.314 number. Now this is liters times kPa over moles Kelvin. 
It's one of those funky derived units, basically using it to cancel all the other units. And then times T over here. So the KPA cancels, the liters cancel, the moles cancel, and after you do the division, it comes out with your Kelvin. So then this particular case, 143 times one, divided by 2.49, divided by 8.314. So the temperature here, doesn't seem like it's very big, but zero. This one has two significant figures, so I'm just gonna go with two. Let me see here, I'm getting 6.9, okay? That's pretty cold. You get 6.9K? Very, very cold. That's getting close to absolute zero. So that's the basic plug and chug one, although they will be a little bit more challenging than that. You'll see in some of the other example problems.